I just kind of thought I'd show you guys this. Uh, April 22nd, um, I woke up this morning, 30 degrees, had like about four inches of snow. Now, it probably won't, I mean, they, they do have plows out. They still had the plows on, uh, luckily, but uh, it probably won't be bad because the it's been warm the last couple of weeks before this, so the roads have warmed up, so it really won't stick to the roads that bad. But anyways, I just kind of thought I'd share that with you guys. Okay, I'm behind the truck. This is the International 7600. As you know from previous uh, updates on this thing, I actually built this whole thing, uh, built this bed. The, when I say this whole thing, I built this bed, which includes this tail part. Now, I put these lights on originally, and somebody brought it to my attention that there are three lights, marker lights, required in the back. Now, we've all seen them on trucks. There's three little individual lights that are separated from the rest of the lights. They're just kind of marker lights. They're, they are not part of turn signals, brakes, or anything else. They're just marker lights. So I am putting them on here. Whether I am actually required to put them on here is an entirely different story. I can find a CFR for trailers that require them, but I'm not finding it for actually for truck beds. Now, I know that truck beds, or truck manufacturers put them on. As a matter of fact, I've even got them in the back of my Ram. There's three lights back there. But I can't actually find a physical rule that says that they're required on trucks. And what the definition of that truck is, is it have to be a truck, if it is a rule and it is required on trucks, is there a limit to the size of the truck that it has to be on? I can't find it, but what I'm gonna do is put them on anyways. So if I, when I take it to get inspected, and this is not a normal New York State inspection, it's gonna be a truck inspection, um, they're there. In case it is a rule and they know about it, I'm gonna have them. But anyways, I just thought I'd bring you over here and show it to you. Now, this is 3 8 plate steel, um, kind of hard to drill through. What I did is I went through with a pilot bit, a 3 8 pilot bit, and then what I do is start it with a 3 quarter inch, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> 3 quarter inch drill bit. Um, but then what I do is because for some reason, I'm ha I have terrible problems with. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. I have terrible problems with three eighths uh, or drill bits. They just seem to burn up on me. So, I found these one of these step bits. I got it, and it works fantastic. So what I do, just kind of score it with a three quarter inch drill bit, then go in in here with this step bit and take it out but then I have to because it is stepped and because the metal is so thick you can see there's you can probably see what almost in the appearance looks like threads but there are the steps in that uh, step bit so what I do after I do with the step bit I go back in there with a three-quarter inch drill drill it out uh, through I'm just going to go back in there um, with the, I got those three quarter inch like marker lights that I have over here. Um, I'll wire them in. But I'll, I'll bring you back because I might wire them into a different circuit than the rest of the marker lights are. But I'll explain that in a, another video when I go to wire it and find out definitely where I am going to wire it to. So here is a forklift with the transmission on the skid. 
Um, it's going back for the core charge back to uh, San Antonio, Texas. Um, I got a bill of lading from them today. Um, I call or emailed them and uh, asked if the carrier was going to contact me, and she said, um, no, the carrier was supposed to be here between 3 and 5 o'clock, so I've kind of hung around. It's 5 o'clock right now and no carrier. I tried to call the number on the uh, bill of lading for the carrier and got uh, some guy's voicemail. Not even sure he just left his name, didn't say it was a business. Um, but anyways, so here I am. I'm going to wait a couple of minutes, see if the guy calls me back or somebody shows up. If not, they're going to have to wait till tomorrow. I'm just showing you the forklift because in the last clip that you saw, I showed you the forklift with the transmission on it. Well, the transmission did get sent back. Um, it didn't get sent back that day that I shot that clip, but it got sent back. Um, long story involving freight brokers and um, shippers and stuff like that. But anyways, um, I had pulled the international out and do uh, so that I could uh, get the forklift out, get the transmission up on the forklift to load into the truck when he came. Uh, and again, he didn't come that day. But anyways, I have those three lights in the back now. Um, they're not wired up yet. That's probably what I'm going to be doing today. That's kind of why I brought this thing back in here. Now, I... Um, the lights that I use um, are are made by Truck Light, and the they came uh, not these style lights. These style lights come with a uh, plug-in connector on the back of them, but these little uh, three-quarter inch uh, lights come with what is called a bullet connector, and it uh, it kind of is, is shaped like a bullet. Um, but it comes with a male bullet connector on the end of it. Um, what I did is ordered some of those uh, female bullet connectors from Truck Light, and I'm kind of waiting for them to come in. I do have some other ones that I have here. Um, these aren't the same. So one that come from Truck Light are uh, like a pigtail. It's a bullet connector pre-assembled with uh, like a eight inch piece of wire off of it. Uh, the bullet connectors I have are the crimp style ones. And I have a lot of problems with bullet connectors because um, of, of the weather conditions around where I live. Uh, you get salt and uh, corrosion in, inside of them and they, they rot out. I'll show you a brief clip of the bullet connectors in a little while, but um, I'm going to call Napa. I ordered the bullet connectors from Truck Light through Napa. Um, I'm going to give them a call just to find out if they're in. If they're not in, I'm probably just going to use the ones that I have already. Um, make sure that they're sealed up good, got dielectric grease in them to try and keep that issue from not happening. Back on February 7th, I posted a shop update, and in that shop update, I told you that uh, that I had to basically put my wife in a home, or my wife was put in a home. Yeah. Yesterday at 2 o'clock in the morning, she died. <laughs> I, I'm not making this video to um, look for sympathy or anything else. I, I, I got to want to explain some things to you guys that could possibly help 
maybe other people. My wife had psychological issues. She, she had bipolar, she was bipolar. She had some schizophrenia issues. She had dementia. She was put in a nursing home because she, she couldn't really care for herself. My wife was a a talker, not a doer. A lot of times that trait got her She was also a blamer and not a person that would accept responsibility. And sometimes those traits got her into trouble. I would jokingly say to people or even say to her sometimes, your, your mouth goes two weeks before your brain engages. But those things, those kind of psychological issues, are a disease or an issue that people have that isn't really the person themselves. It's an issue. So, because of the COVID thing, we weren't allowed to go into the nursing home. There was restrictions in the state of New York. I don't know how it is in the other states. But if any um, patients or staff members in a nursing home. Now this didn't pertain to a hospital. The rules in our hospital were different because they had isolation wards and stuff like that. Um, but in a nursing home in New York State, you weren't allowed to visit um, if there had been any reported cases of COVID in either staff or patients. So in the entire time, it was approximately two months that she was in there. Um, in the entire time, there was a day, uh, I, there was one day that I know of, possibly two days, that, that you were allowed visitation. <clears throat> but there were stipulations to that visitation. You had to be, have been tested for COVID within 72 hours prior to your visitation and you also had to schedule your visitation. So you had to work out a schedule, figure out what the schedule, what day you could visit and then have a COVID test within 72 hours of that visitation and have the results in hand when you went to the visitation. That, like I had said, it only lasted for a day or two. And there's a point to this, so just kind of bear with me. We, we were never allowed to visit her, so we made, uh, it was all done by phone calls. The staff were real good about it. Um, you could call up and um, to wherever your family member was, the ward or area you would call the, like the nurse's station and they would get them on the phone for you so that you could talk to them. <clears throat> Again, my wife had psychological issues, so she thought that she 
was capable of living on by herself or living at home. She was distraught when she was distraught when we put her in the home because she, in her mind she felt that she was able to stay at home. Every time that I talked to her, she was upset and, and mad at me because I wasn't, didn't come and get her, that I couldn't com come in and see her, that I didn't come to get her. She, she didn't understand it at all. She. The home that she was put into is fairly new, and is, is, again, even, ever since my wife went into that nursing home, I had never got to see her, never went in to see her, was able to go in to see her. The place was really nice, but I didn't know that. <laughs> that I didn't know that until the end. So when I would call her, she would say, I, I hate this place, I, I want to go home. She couldn't understand why I didn't come down and pick her up and take her home. My wife was the kind of person that would retaliate against you by trying to do things, by saying things and doing things that would try to champion her cause or what she thought was her cause. She would go days at a time when not eating or not drinking and make herself sick. And there would be other times where you wouldn't keep, be able to keep enough food into the house because she would just eat everything in sight. So we had gone, I had gone through a, a couple of things while she was in the home where um, she had fallen. She was always prone to doing that falling and she bumped her head and she got a cut and they had to take her over to the emergency room and have her sewed up. And um, so things like that would always happen. Well, three or four days ago, I got a call from them and said, um, that one of the nurses and said, um, listen, we couldn't wake your wife up this morning and uh, she's got a fever, um, a fever of 102 and um, we couldn't wake her up so the doctor's gonna come in and see her and uh, we'll kind of figure it out but I we just wanted to let you know that this was going on and um, somebody will get back to you pretty, fairly quickly. The doctor called me back and said, I, I think she might be developing pneumonia, but it, it's really kind of early to tell. Um, but um, she, she's having trouble breathing and um, she does have a fever and we can't really get her to wake up, respond to us. She she just doesn't respond. She doesn't want to wake up. She doesn't wake up. So um, 
she says, I'm going to set up visitation for you, and you can come in and see her. So a little while later, this woman, she's called a social worker from the home, called me and said, um, I've set up visitation for you. You can come in right now if you want to with the front desk. She says there's going to be some precautions that you have to do to come in and visit her, but uh, yeah, you can come in right now. And I says, well, is she responsive? I, I mean, is she going to know that I'm there? Is she awake? Have you taken care of this? And she says, well, I'm no, she's not responsive. Um, and I says, well, is do, do you is it going to do me any is it going to do her any good if I come in thinking that she was sick? <clears throat> and she says, I I think you should come in right now. As soon as I walked into her room, I knew. She wasn't, she hadn't died, but I knew that I knew that we were looking at the end. We had been married for 50 years. And you kind of just know, after that amount of time, regardless of what the relationship is, you just kind of know when things are going to happen and when things are going to happen and what's going on and what's not going on. As soon as I walked into that room, I knew. I tried to wake her up and get her to respond, and you could see eye fluttering. Her eyelids never opened up, but you could see eye fluttering. I knew that she knew that I was there, and that she was responding to it. But, but here we go about the person with I call it demons. Her psychological issues are demons in my mind. And I'm not saying that from a religious point of view or context of being associated with the devil. I, I'm saying that they are demons in the respect that they kind of control her attitude and outlook. I knew that the, it was going to be the end. What I, I don't know, didn't know, was what she could understand or not understand was happening at the time. Through our 50 years of marriage, because of her psychological issues, she had a tendency of blaming me for everything that happened. Regardless if I didn't have anything, she wouldn't, if she caused a problem and it wasn't her, she would think it wasn't her responsibility or her fault. It was always somebody else's fault. And th that somebody else usually turned out to be me because I was the one that was there. I was the easiest one for her to blame. Given that point of view, Yeah.
and knowing that she had lived with these demons for so long. I didn't want the end of her life to be any kind of trauma or issues. I knew that once it was over, that she wouldn't have to suffer through. She wouldn't have to suffer through these hardships anymore. There would be no more demons. I'm not the type of person that can just sit around. I, I can sit for a while. I can drive and sit all day long. But if I'm out of a truck, I, I can't sit. I'm, I'm not a person that just sits and, and does nothing, you know? I mean, I can sit and like read. I can sit and do things. But I can't sit still for very long. So a couple of things were going through my mind. I said, I was thinking to myself, there's, there's no way that I can sit in this room and just watch her die. The other thing that was going through my mind at the same time I don't know if I want to be in this room <laughs> because she kind of deserves something better. I don't want her knowing that she, she had animosities and issues with me. I didn't want her last moments of life being with this somebody that could maybe irritating or agitating her. Not that I was irritating or agitating her per se, it's what was in her mind. I wanted the last moments of her life to be peaceful, as peaceful as possible. The two people that she really loved and she really didn't show a lot of disrespect or show these demons to was her grandchildren, two of her grandchildren, Matt, who you've seen in my videos, and my granddaughter, Danny, who happened to be a nurse at the adjoining hospital facility. So I kind of left it with them to be with her.
at the end, whether just to be with her there and they could, uh, if she didn't die then, she, they could go home and at least the last moments that if she was even recognizing that were people were there, would be with somebody that she had loved and didn't cause her grief in her mind. So that was day one. I left. Danny and Matt went down there and they stayed with her. And then at nighttime, the staff asked them, told them that they had to leave. So they left. And the next day, they came back and they stayed with her. And I talked to them and we all knew what was going on. We all knew that my wife had given up. She had probably given up thinking not understanding she had given up because she couldn't understand. She wanted to go home. She couldn't, she probably gave up thinking that she was in a place that she didn't like and she wasn't at home. And because of her dementia, and not understanding or us telling her but not remembering what we told her five minutes later, she probably couldn't understand why she couldn't go home. She had given up. She had just given up the fight. And you could tell that. You could tell that she had given up. The, that there was, even though that she consciously probably didn't understand this, but she probably realized that there was never going to be any quality of life. any quality of life left for her. <laughs> so uh, I left her final hours with my grandchildren, just so that if she, if they, at all she was conscious of what was going on, that the people in the room with her would be people that she realized that she loved and cared for. So in the final hours, Let me back up a little bit. The day before when I told you that the kids were there and, and the staff made her leave, they were insistent upon that she, she was gonna die that night. 
that she would She would never make it through the night. So back into the next day. They told me that they were there and my grandson Matt kept telling me that he knew the end was there. that he knew that the end was going to be there. <sighs> Danny and Matt would actually lay in bed with her, one on each side of her, and tell her how much they loved her. And they, they knew that she knew. She, they had, that she had given up hope. And that it was okay for her to just let it go. <laughs> they would put me on the phone, put the phone on her head so she could listen to me tell her that there was no hard feelings or no resentment about the way she had treated me. That we knew that it wasn't her, it was just the demons in her doing all of this. that we knew, that she knew that, that if she passed, that it would all be over for her. There would be no more demons left. That if there was an afterlife, then that she could go back and be with her parents. Danny had to leave. And it came about 11 o'clock and I thought Matt had probably gonna be leaving too. But Matt somehow knew that the end was coming. was coming for her. At about 1.30 in the morning, Matt and I were talking on the phone. And I asked him when he was gonna be leaving and he said, it's gonna happen. 
It's going to happen soon. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to go to sleep here for a little bit. I, I got to take a nap. And I fell asleep. Twenty minutes later, I got the phone call from him saying, She had passed, but she woke up, her eyes opened up, and she looked at him, and he was able to tell her that we loved her, and that it was all right for her to go, that it would be over. There would be no more demons. She could go back and visit her mother. And she loved it. <laughs> but, she, but she did it in a way that I can be at peace with. She did it in Matt's arms, hopefully understanding that we all loved her. So with this all being said, just understand if you know of anybody that has these issues, it's not really them. Again, it's these issues that dictate the way that they respond and act with other people. I didn't have a great marriage. It was hard living with her. She threatened to kill me all the time. She would go into graphic and vivid details about how she wanted to kill me. But it wasn't her. It was the demons doing this to her. And in the end, I just wanted her to be at peace with herself. I wanted her to leave this life in a way that there was no pain, there was no demons, and there was people around her that loved and cared for her and that it was okay to go. And hopefully that's the way it ended. But it is the way this video is gonna end.